Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be painting some of the fantastic new Cities of Sigmar miniatures. I was very inspired by the studio's awesome paint jobs, and I couldn't resist the urge to pick up my brushes and get started. And although I really liked all of the schemes showcased, there were two that really stood out to me and became instant favourites, these being Greywater Fastness and Lethys. In the first part of this video, I'll tackle the tarnished city of Lethys which sits within the realm of death itself, and as such this scheme uses a lot of very pale and desaturated colours, which are then accented by the deep purple of the cloth and shield. So if you're as excited as I am, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button and ring the bell for future painting tutorials. Without further ado, let's get into the painting. I'll be using the Free Guild Steel Helms for both of these tutorials, and these came as part of the new army set. The miniatures themselves are highly detailed and very characterful sculpts, with lots of different little details which help them to feel quite unique and individual, despite being part of a unit. They also have a fairly diverse selection of weapon options and heads to choose from. It seemed like the sergeant would be a good choice for Lethys, as the miniature had a few little skull details that I felt would be quite befitting of the city. So I set about removing the mold lines from the parts, which for the most part were actually quite subtle and hard to find. Nevertheless, I decided to get out some Tamiya sponge, which would also help to remove any finer mold lines. I've been using these sponges for a couple of years now, and they've become a regular part of my cleanup process. They're really useful as they're soft enough to not risk removing any details for the most part, whilst helping to buff out any minor imperfections on the surface. Once that was done, I went on to glue the parts together using Tamiya thin plastic cement. For this miniature, I decided to leave the shield arm and head as separate sub-assemblies, as I just prefer to paint these parts individually. Of course, you don't have to do this and you should glue together as much as you feel comfortable with. For me, I like to get to any difficult to reach areas more easily, and I find parts like this are also very easy just to glue in place at the end without any gap filling needed. Speaking of gap filling, there were a couple that needed attention where the two parts of the torso connected, and this was easily filled with some green stuff and a silicon tool, and then it was time to prime the miniature. So my preferred primer for this is Vallejo Black Airbrush Primer, but really you could use any can primer. I just find this one a lot more reliable, and it also works out much more economical than buying cans. With all of the preparation now out of the way, I was ready to start getting some paint onto the miniature. This scheme has a lot of metallics, which I like to get out of the way first. For the bulk of the armour, I'm going to be using a paint called Exhaust Manifold by Vallejo. This is a pre-thinned airbrush paint and requires no extra thinning. I simply apply it evenly to all of the armour panels, and after a couple of coats, I have a great looking metal base coat, which is then ready for some shading. Before going on to shade the armour, I first base coated the more ornate details, like the shield trim here, using Runelord Brass, and this did require a couple of thin coats to get a nice solid base coat. Now back to the armour again, and it was time to add some shading. For this, I'm going to be using one of my favourite newer contrast paints called Rattling Grime. This is basically a slightly brown dark shade tone, which you could also substitute with something like a mix of Agrax and Non Oil. And I thin this down just with water, applying it into the recesses of the armour, carefully directing the wash where I wanted it to dry, and building it up over a couple of thin layers. I also repeated this stage for all of the other working metal areas on the miniature, including the helmet and inner shield details. Now it was time to shade the brass, and for this I'm going to be using another awesome contrast paint called Wildwood. This is a really nice rich warm shade tone that will work great on the brass areas. And again I'm applying this over a couple of thin coats, pushing the paint into the recesses and around any rivets. 
Once the shading was done, I quickly went around any bits that needed tidying on both of these metallic areas to prepare them for the highlight stage. Now for these highlights, I'm going to be using probably the best metallic paint ever made, and that's Vallejo Model Air Silver. Of course, you could use the Games Workshop equivalent, I think it's Stormhost Silver or something like that, but honestly, this paint will make your life so much easier. And with the brass highlights, I'm adding this into the Rune Lord until it was mostly just silver, and then I use this to quickly apply some edge highlights to the brass. The Vallejo Silver has very fine metallic flakes, and it also flows really well, making it the perfect choice for a nice sharp edge highlight. Once that was done, I added some verdigris to the brass trim on the shield with a very thin down Sons of Horus green. And I'm mostly concentrating this around the rivets and recesses. And I built this up a couple of times to increase the effect. I went on to finish the other brass details on the miniature before going on to apply some highlights to the working metal areas. And again for this I use Vallejo Silver. Now I could have also gone on to glaze some of the silver into some areas to brighten them up a bit and perhaps try to describe the volume of the armour a bit more. But really I wanted to keep this pretty straightforward and also still keep it looking quite grimy and dark. In part 2 I'll cover another much brighter steel armour so consider checking that out if it's more to your taste. Keeping the metallic so simple, just a base coat, some careful shading and a nice sharp highlight. It really didn't take too long to do and I still think this could be quite achievable for an army. Now I felt like some areas would naturally get more battle damaged, especially like the head of the hammer here, so I spent a little extra time adding some chips and scratches. And next I decided to tackle the boot gaiters, which I base coated using Administratum Grey. Once that was dry I made an equal mix of Dawnstone and Dryad Bark and then washed this into the recesses of the cloth. The dryad bark just helped to add a warmer colour into the shading and make it a bit closer to the box art scheme. But really I think there's a few different brown tones that you could add into this to get a similar effect. I then increased this shading in a few places by adding some dark grey into the mix. Something like eshing grey would be the citadel equivalent. Now it was time to add some highlights to the cloth and for this I used grey seal. If you don't have this paint then any light grey would work or even just adding white into the administratum. And then for the final highlights, I added some white into the grey here, and then used this to pick out a few of the upwards facing corners and edges. Now for the trousers, I wanted a darker contrasting grey, so I base coated them using Skaven Blight Dinge, and then to shade this I added black into the Skaven Blight and glazed this into the recesses, 
I'm roughly following the box art version here. However, I think there's a few different colours that would actually work quite nicely instead of the grey. For example, an olive green, blue grey, brown or even black. I would just try to keep the colours for the clothes fairly desaturated so that it fits in with the theme of Lethus and also so that it doesn't steal too much attention from the rich purples. Now to highlight this, I use Storm Vermin Fur, carefully building this up with quite thin paint and trying to keep the blends nice and soft. By keeping the paint quite thin and applying it with very light strokes with the tip of the brush, I could build up the paint slowly to create softer transitions. And then for the final highlights, I added increasing amounts of Administratum Grey into the Storm Vermin Fur. Something like Carrick Stone would also work quite well for these final stages. Now onto the wood for the shield and for this I first base coated it using Rhinox Hide and I then shaded this down with a very thin down black paint. You could also use something like non oil for this. I will say that I think the shield came out slightly more brown than the box art version and I think that version was much more desaturated. So if you do want it to look a bit more like that then I would probably just add a bit more black and grey into these mixes and I think it would end up a much closer match. Once that was dry, I started to highlight the wood grain on the shield using dryad bark. For the next highlight I added some Gawthor brown into the dryad bark and then continued to pick out the details on the wood. And if you don't have Gawthor brown you could also add any mid-tone grey into the dryad bark to desaturate the highlights further. Something like Dawnstone would work well. Now for the final highlights I added some Administratum Grey into the Gawthor Brown. Now it was time to paint the shield emblem with that lovely rich burgundy or purple hue. This is probably the most striking part of the whole scheme so I wanted to make sure that I got fairly close to the studio version. And after testing a few different paints I think I eventually got close with around a 3 to 1 mix of Screamer Pink and Corn Red. Which then I could deepen by adding black into the mix. I approached the shield slightly differently than the clothes and I'm pretty sure that's what they did for the box art version. And you'll see later on how I did this. But with the shield emblem itself, I started by base coating it with the screamer and corn mix. I then glazed this down towards the bottom of the shield with the thinned down mix including the black. When I'm glazing larger areas like this you can see that I start with the brush around the middle of the shield and then I'm pushing the pigment towards the shaded area as the majority of this pigment will be left where the brush leaves the surface. Glazing back the opposite way with the screamer and corn mix helps to smooth out the transition further and this can be done as many times as necessary to achieve a smooth blend. I then placed a chunky edge highlight with the screamer and corn mix around the shaded half of the shield. For the next stage highlight I added a shabty bone into the screamer and corn mix 
I then use this to paint a slightly finer edge highlight around all of the edges of the emblem. This was then followed by glazing towards the top of the shield with the same mix to further brighten it. And you'll see later on why this was actually a really important step, and I'm quite glad that I did it. Also using the same mix, I added some scuffs and scratches across the surface of the emblem. It makes a lot of sense to me that this shield would have seen some action, and naturally it would get some battle damage. To further pick out this damage, I added some Screaming Skull into the mix, and then I also used this same mix to further add some sharper highlights around the edges of the emblem. Once that was done, I could then apply the transfer to the shield, and I think now it becomes a bit more obvious why I ended up pushing the top of the emblem brighter, as this actually helps the raven wings on the Lethys iconography to stand out much better. I then applied a thin coat of Microsol to help the transfer adhere to the surface. Once that was dry, I needed to mat down the transfer, and for this I used a layer of AK Ultra Matte Varnish. When that was then dry, I applied a few quick glazes of a thinned down rattling grime towards the bottom of the skull icon, and this just helps to make the transfer feel like it's part of the surface, and it makes it feel more painted on, as well as adding a few chips and scratches to further blend it in. I then picked out the remaining rivets with the brass, and that was about it for the shield. When it came to the purple clothing, this time I started much darker than the shield, mixing some black into the screamer and corn mix, and then applying this in a few thin coats until I'd built up a solid base coat. And if you are looking for a premix paint that's somewhat similar to this colour, although not exact, then Baraknar Burgundy is kinda close. Now, I think with a lot of the studio paint jobs across the cities of Sigmar range, that they made a conscious effort to differentiate between all of the various materials on the miniature, and if you look carefully you can see that they painted the cloth very subtly differently to the shields across a few of the different schemes. Now, of course, having two different recipes for this isn't ideal for speed painting, so it might be better to only use one if this is the case. I personally really enjoy painting and taking my time a bit more with my miniatures, and that is something that hopefully translates to the final results. And unlike many other channels nowadays, I'm not going to claim to have the fastest or the easiest methods, but hopefully it's still useful for many people to see the process and the methods used to achieve a similar result to the box art paint job. As you can see, I've continued highlighting around the cloth areas with the screamer and corn mix, although I have tried to keep the darker purple as the most predominant colour. When it came to the next highlight stage, I also changed this very slightly from the shield recipe and opted to instead use Carrick Stone. I'm hoping this creates a slightly warmer tone, as can be seen on the studio version, although it is hard to work out exactly what they used. I mix this in around 1 to 1 with the previous highlight stage, and I'm using this mostly around the most raised folds of the cloth, although I do enjoy the extra readability and definition of adding a nice sharp line around the hem of the tunic. 
As a last stage, I added some Screaming Skull into the mix and then applied this very sparingly to the sharpest corners of the cloth. When it came to the various leather straps and the belt, I first base coated these areas using Rhinox Hide. I decided to paint this leather slightly differently from the studio version and instead opted to add a bit more warmth into the highlights as I thought this would complement with the purple cloth. If you do want a result that's slightly closer to the more desaturated leather, I'd probably still start with something like Rhinox Hide, but instead add something like Baneblade Brown or Carrick Stone into it for the highlights. Some of these leather sections, and in particular the belt, had a bit of a sculpted texture which I tried to reinforce with the highlight stages. For the next stage highlights, I added XV88 into the Thondia Brown and used this to further pick out the textures and the edges of the leather. Further highlights were then made by adding increasing amounts of Carrick Stone into this mix. I then went on to paint the haft of the hammer using the same recipe that I'd used for the wood on the shield before going on to paint his black leather boots. And for this I used a very straightforward neutral black recipe that I tend to use quite a lot, starting with a chunky edge highlight of Eshin Grey and then working my way up through Dawnstone and then finally a Ministratum Grey for the sharpest highlights. There's already a lot of other grey tones going on with the miniature. So I think keeping black areas like this quite minimal and just by adding a couple of sharp highlights it actually helps to keep it looking black and stops it merging with the other areas of the miniature. Finally, I added a few small dots of white to the corners to really sell the look of a shiny black leather. The few small skull icons dotted around the miniature were then base coated with a pale grey and given a highlight of pure white. Now the people of Lethys are known for their pale complexions, so when it came to painting the face I wanted to make sure that I started off quite bright. I also felt that this would help to add to the battle hardened and gaunt appearance. I figured it's got to be a tough existence in the realm of Shaish, desperately fighting off the hordes of undead on a daily basis. And this guy is a sergeant so he's definitely seen some horrors during his career. So just like a lot of the other colours on the miniature, I desaturated the skin by adding some grey into the base coat. This was then quickly shaded down with a wash of Doomball Brown, although I do like to add a touch of the Cadian Flesh Tone into this so that it's not quite so harsh. Further shading was then added with a mix of Doomball Brown and Black and this was used very sparingly around the deeper recesses of the face. It's important to only add a very tiny amount of black into this mix so as not to overpower the Doomball and to also be quite minimal with the application so that I can keep the overall pale look. I then went on to brighten the skin tone further with some soft highlights by adding white into the Cadian and Admin Grey mix and I steadily built up these highlights towards the top of the raised features of the face like the cheekbones, the brow, the nose and lips. 
Finally, I picked out the eyes with an off-white and then carefully dotted the pupils with black. And that was about it for this miniature. If you made it this far into the video then thank you so much for taking the time to watch my content and there's just enough time here to say a huge thank you to all these wonderful people on Patreon and without their incredible support I wouldn't be able to upload content like this to YouTube. Make sure to stay tuned for part 2 and this awesome grey water scheme as this will be on the way very soon and a bit sooner for patrons. So I'll catch you next time.